Welcome to Reddit Aliens. Serious. Those who explored abandoned buildings that went seriously wrong. What happened? Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. When I was a teenager, and some friends and I had nowhere to live, we found an abandoned house in a fairly dodgy suburb to live in. One of the people I was with said it used to be a drug dealer's place, and he had left town indefinitely, so we figured we would be safe to squat there for a while. It had super high fences, which we had to climb to break in through the back door, and the first thing we saw was an old dog chain that had been snapped, and there was dried blood around it on the concrete. It's not super relevant, but it gives you an idea of how grungy the place looked. We all slept in one bedroom out of the back that had no front-facing windows, and when we left during the day, we would hide our backpacks in the ceiling through a hole we found. At night, we kept all the lights off. One night, we got awoken by a massive banging on the front door, like really loud thumping that reverberated through the entire house. Think like if the cops were desperately trying to get the attention of someone in an apartment. There was nothing shouted, so we knew it wasn't police. We just stayed as quiet as we could until it went away. The next morning, when we left, there was a huge knife shoved through the wood at the front, embedded halfway down the blade. We left it there. The girl that was with us decided it was not safe there, so she took off the next day. I don't remember where she went, but she didn't come back. She probably went to one of the shelters in the city. Me and the remaining guy went out a day or two later to get some food, and when we got back, we found that the windows had all been smashed in by rocks thrown through the windows. The remaining furniture had been trashed, beds flung onto their sides, couches pushed apart with their cushions ripped. Someone had clearly been looking for something. We said F it, booked it out of there, and moved to a park. Way more open, but significantly less terrifying. I was walking through a fourth floor of an abandoned orphanage in the chapel, and the only light I had to guide me was faint from the video camera before smartphones, and as I pointed it down to routinely light the floor to check, I was a foot away from stepping into a giant hole in the floor, almost two meters wide, dropping down below. My heart dropped and then an effing bat flew overhead. It scared me, and scared the shit out of me as well. Some people romanticize the idea of all the urban exploring, but the truth is, after having done it, these things are very common, and they can be quite dangerous, so take heed. You'll hear a lot after this. I used to go through abandoned buildings with my dad, a fireman in near west suburban Chicago. We ran into a bunch of homeless guys burning the coating off wire. My dad and the police moved them on from the building. Later that night, they were doing the same in another building down the block, which led to a three alarm fire and two abandoned factories burning to the ground. As a kid, my cousin and I went exploring in an abandoned old church. He, being the more adventurous of the two, had decided to go climbing and seeing if he could get on top of the roof. Well, it wasn't exactly stable and luckily he didn't get all the way to the top when he fell. He copped a nasty gash on his leg in the process though, and it was a long walk back to our grandmother's house to get attended to, purely because we kept stopping. Needless to say, we were banned from exploring there. Some friends and I were exploring in an old abandoned slave church in the deep South Georgia woods. There were graves dug up in the cemetery and the church itself was falling apart. There was one hallway with a room in the back that had the door cracked. I was the first one in the hallway, and as I got to the door to the room in the back, I heard someone in the room go, shh. Went to turn and run out of there, but my girlfriend at the time was leaned against the wall in a daze, looking at the ground. I had to grab her hand and pull her to get her going. It was weird. We used to play airsoft King of the Hill games in an old early 1900s mansion that had been abandoned since the 80s in the Illinois cornfields. We never went deep into the basement because it was partially flooded and at the same time gave everyone a very weird feeling when we would get to the bottom of the steps. Well, one day we decided to play a night game and the whole vibe of the house was off. It felt like there was someone standing right behind you the entire time and we kept hearing noises and sloshing water coming from the basement, so we booked it out of there, and as we were leaving, we all swear we saw a light come on really quick up in the attic and then go dark. Not seriously wrong, but I was pretty scared. I was around 10 years old or so. 
I went into this not that old abandoned building with two of my friends. They were boys. We explored the building and got down to the basement and we met some boys from ninth grade and we went with them. We got pretty deep into the basement and then all of a sudden a woman starts to scream. We couldn't see anybody since it was very dark. We had flashlights and flashed around the room. Keep in mind I was the only girl with the group of boys and my friends. We just ran out after that as the screaming continued. We all agreed to never enter again. It was a really old house in the woods. Pretty sure there was a fire or something because there was a stone slab and chimney next to the house where a place used to be with fire damage. Three of us wanted to see what was in the place, so we started exploring. Some ruined furniture was still there and moth-eaten carpet. Coolest thing in there was an old wooden chair with some impressive carving work. We ventured upstairs and that is when things went wrong. Two steps in and creak, crack, the floor split open and my buddy's leg went through. Lucky for him, he had jeans on and nothing got broken. We decided not to check out the rest of the place and made our way out of the woods before it got dark. My friend almost fell off of a four-story building. There were four of us out at an abandoned radar base filming a music video for one of my classes. And there's a part where you can jump down from the roof to another part that is slightly lower. Now, it's a more narrow kind of landing area, and as he jumped down, he landed weird on his foot and swerved off to the side and was less than an inch or so from falling off before he caught his balance and landed on his knees on the roof. Everyone else carefully climbed down that ledge instead of jumping after that. If you're at a popular urban exploring site, this is not uncommon at all. It's happened to friends of mine and myself, so one group scares another group and everyone's quiet and then everybody freaks out, but then usually works out pretty well. Doing some urbexing a few years back with a group of photographers over in northeast New Jersey and an abandoned sanatorium with pretty high security since it remains are now in a relatively upscale area. The photographers were mostly all doing it for the gram, while I was more about the adventure and seeing what kind of interesting shit I could find in the locations. Well, we had to synchronize sneaking in through this window to get in without being detected by the local fuzz, who would do regular patrols on the grounds, but not generally the interiors unless they had to. We were all on the third floor when I, alert as ever, heard voices that weren't coming from us, what sounded like down the hall. So we became ninjas and tried to sneak to the lower floors to avoid detection. We crept into this one open room in the floor beneath us only to scare the bejesus out of another older mid to late 40s or 50s group of urban explorers who were coincidentally trying to hide from us for the same reason. We all had a good laugh then parted ways. So this happened one year ago. I was with my best friend at a pretty known abandoned house in my city. Almost every weekend we would go there, have fun and drink. Nobody was interrupting us, but one night as we entered, we noticed some homeless people walking around and yelling. At that point, we knew that we should get out of there. The problem was that those guys already saw us and started chasing us, not running, but still. Him and I decided to run and hide in a bus station nearby. After 10 minutes, the homeless guys were around the corner of the street and holding some kind of knife. There were four guys. It was 11 at night, so we got really scared and went to one of my friend's houses 500 meters from there. We called the police and it turns out that those dudes have been stealing in buses and doing this kind of stuff all over the city. I was pretty scared from that situation. I don't know if this counts. I was 16 and a couple of friends of mine wanted to check out this abandoned train station. When we got there, everything seemed to be normal for an abandoned site, graffiti, trash, etc. But there was this one little building there that looked weirdly clean and well preserved. So we decided to go in through the window since the door was locked. Inside we found this big piece of metal and the following sentence was carved in it. Our dream is wakefulness. Our enemy is dreamless sleep. And there were a bunch of doll Barbie heads hanging from the ceiling. Then we heard a noise. When I look back, it was probably a rat and ran away as quick as we could. I think I still have a photo of that metal piece. Still creeps me out. But why smear the walls with poop would be the question. Did they somehow want you to wear a gas mask? Or I don't know. What do you think? 
It wasn't really wrong per se, but incredibly gross nevertheless. I was exploring an abandoned gas station, which happened to also have some abandoned mobile homes on its property. As I walked through the mobile home, my friend was complaining of a foul smell. I couldn't smell anything as I was wearing my gas mask to protect from asbestos, and I wandered into a room only to discover someone had covered it with feces. Walls painted with poop, floors covered in neat little piles, and a filthy mattress. As soon as I got outside and took my mask off, the smell hit me and I lost my lunch in some tall grass. I used to live in Virginia when I was younger, and I had a good friend that I often stayed over at her house. Her dad had her one weekend and invited me over. We ended up going to his friend's house. It was a beautiful plantation house out in King George, I think, County. Three-story house with a lot of the original Civil War era furniture still inside. Some of the beds and stuff had sheets on them, and the Smithsonian was supposed to come out and get the furniture. The guy had gotten a great deal on the house because it was so old and needed work and was apparently haunted. The house was amazing. There were little metal lined holes in the wall in each room where a little fire would go and I think piping connected them, but I wasn't really sure. There was a small cot in one of the upstairs rooms that still had bullet holes in it and there were dark spots on the floor that may have been blood and there were bullet holes in the ceiling. The guy that lived there had a friend come and bless the very bottom floor where he lived. It was like a studio apartment. There was a bathroom, a kitchen-like area, a fireplace, and a pull-out couch that he slept on. He told us how there would be footsteps all night throughout the upper floors and banging on the door that led to upstairs, which he obviously kept closed and locked at night. Now on to the abandoned building part. My friend and I decided to explore the property, which had several slave cabins on it. They were pretty dilapidated and in need of some serious repair when looking from the outside. We decided to go into one and found a lot of furniture and paintings that were in surprisingly good shape. Upon entering the cabin though, we just got this overwhelming feeling that we were not supposed to be there. It just felt wrong. Like this overwhelming feeling of dread. I told my friend that I felt like I felt some bad things had happened there. We decided to press on and started up a ladder that went to a loft inside the cabin. There were holes in the roof and we could see sunlight coming through. I got up to the top, looked into the loft and just felt like I had to get out of there now. I didn't see any ghosts or bodies, nothing creepy happened, nothing moved. I just knew I had to get the F out of there. I don't know how to describe it other than that. Maybe it was supernatural, maybe it was my mind playing tricks on me, but something told my little 13 year old brain to get out of that slave cabin that day or else. So we did. Me and my friend got the hell up out of there. As soon as we left and had taken a few steps away from the cabin, we could feel the dread and trepidation just melting away. I'm in my 30s now and it's an experience that I share all the time because of how intense that emotion was. Even now as I type this, I feel that dread washing over me as I remember those paintings behind the couch in the cabin and how my legs trembled as I climbed the ladder. Was working at a huge old farm in New Hampshire. It was raining one weekend, so they pulled us mostly out of the fields and into the farm building to do work. I was tasked with going up over the gift shop into the old barn and bringing down some folding chairs. I climbed up the stairs into what was clearly the old office area. Everything in it looked to be from the 1950s. It really looked like they had just shut the door to the offices one day and never went back. I don't know if it was the gloom of the day or what, but there was a stillness in the air up there that just unnerved me. It honestly felt like the room was holding its breath or was listening for something. Like when you think you hear an unknown noise in your house, so you go very still to see if you can hear it again. I didn't like it and I didn't want to get in trouble for dawdling where I wasn't supposed to be so I pushed on through to the main loft of the barn. I crossed through the door to the hayloft, and I notice immediately to my right, there's a ladder that goes up into a room at the roof of the barn. I've never seen anything like this. It's like there's a room at the very top of the barn with a single doorway in and out of it. Not a couple or anything like that. It doesn't connect to the outside. It's easily 15 feet up from the flo floor I'm standing on. The first thought to pop into my head was that they kept someone up there, 
I look into that doorway from the foot of the ladder, and it is black, blacker than black, and suddenly I'm totally transfixed by this darkness. I could feel something up there staring back down at me, and whatever it is, it does not want me there, with an intensity that I could honestly describe as hatred. I force myself to turn away from it and retreat back down to the main building to collect myself. My sister was also working there at the time, so I grab her and a friend to help me out because I am not going back up there alone. I say nothing about the feeling I had because I didn't want to spook them, but when my sister gets up there, she too reacts to the darkness and the overwhelming malevolence in it. We quickly gathered what we could and booked it out of there. It's hard to describe feeling so threatened on a primal level, but not being able to pinpoint where it is coming from. We sometimes mention it to each other still, almost 25 years later. Do you ever sit back and take stock of all the foolish, silly things you did in your youth and say, how am I here? Uh, or am I the only one? I don't think so. I went into this creepy abandoned mansion that was also used as a mental institution before it was abandoned. Didn't even expect to get in, but a connecting building had an opening and I just wound up in the mansion. Anyway, super cool place, right out of a horror movie. As I'm finishing up exploring the place, I come up on a room on the top floor. Door was open, and as I walked in I noticed the sign. It read, Warning, high level of asbestos in this area. If you've been exposed, go to nearby hospital immediately. Tried to breathe as little as possible as I booked it out of there. Didn't go to the hospital because I doubt it could have been exposed to so much asbestos. I'll have problems, and even if I was, there's nothing a hospital is going to be able to do anyway. Instead, I went home, threw all my clothes in the wash, took a shower, and bought a gas mask for future explorations. It was in the forest behind the neighborhood I lived in as a child. It was called the Abandoned Grease Factory, a pretty spooky place for kids in the neighborhood to visit. Me and a buddy get asked by two kids, who were about three or four years older than us, to go check it out. We agreed because we thought it would be cool. The two older guys, after arriving, begin making a shit ton of noise like banging on walls, shouting, climbing to the top of the building, and throwing shit off. Me and my buddy think nothing of it. Well, out of nowhere, the two disappear. Me and my buddy begin swearing, trying to figure out where to go. Lo and behold, three cops walk out from around the corner and grab us. I guess the two older kids knew that the cops come check the place often, and they were causing a scene to attract the cops and get us in trouble. We were in fifth grade, I believe. My parents were not happy to see us arrive at the house in the back of a cop car. We then became mortal enemies with the older dudes, always trying to get back at them. Nothing very serious, I guess, went wrong, but... Man, will I hate those guys forever. <laughs> when I was living on my own for the first time, I had my first own dog. She was a beautiful Doberman and not quite full grown. She was nasty, aggressive. She didn't bite. She was socialized, spoiled, and loved. But she was bitchy, growly, like a grouchy old lady of a soul. But I loved the hell out of this dog. One warm, beautiful New Orleans night, I took her with me to explore. I should never have brought her. I was young and irresponsible. FYI, I would never risk the safety of my pet like this now. I didn't have a leash on her. The place I was exploring looked okay. It was a beautiful classic New Orleans house. Four stories, full balconies, enclosed private courtyard. Not like broken glass everywhere or anything too bad she can get into. But it felt uneasy, which is unusual because I feel very comfortable with doing that kind of thing. Being in the dark, unseen, feels very safe to me, but not that night. I felt distinctly unwelcomed. I went up to the third floor. It was beautiful. Big windows, balconies, a full moon night. Flashlight off. I walked out the back, and the back balcony was gone. I looked out over the coolest courtyard. Lots of bricks, so not totally overgrown. I was looking down at how neat it was. Fountains and statues, and she just sailed silently right by me at full speed, right off the side of the building. It was slow motion and silent like a movie. I looked down and I could see her lying below, flat on her belly, all four legs spread, like she just landed splat. The dread and panic, the unwelcome feeling that had been in the back of my mind, suddenly screaming so loud in my brain like, 
You should never have effing come here, bitch. You were not welcome here. I only looked down for a second before running down, but I could clearly see a puddle of blood forming. I could see it in the moonlight, black and shining and spreading. I could see it was a lot of blood, and she was completely still. I ran down two flights of stairs so fast and into the courtyard. She was sitting, staring at me, just sitting there. I grabbed her up, still terrified, still feeling this horrible sense of dread like the place was screaming at me to get the F out. There was blood all over her belly. It was on my arms and clothes. I ran, carrying her to my car, put her in the back, jumped in the driver's seat, started driving fast. I reached back and felt her, but didn't feel blood. I looked at my rear view, and she was just staring at me still. I pulled over and reached in back and felt all over her. No blood. I got home and no blood. In fact, she was fine, just bopping around being herself. No bruises, no swelling, no pain. Didn't even go to the vet because she was straight fine. I don't know how, but I swear she had been covered in blood. I saw it all over my arms and shirt when I had gotten in the car. I felt it warm and slick. I could effing smell it like strong copper. It had been a puddle, but it was not there when I got home. We didn't go back to that house again. Good. My middle school friends and I decided to explore an abandoned house, which was rumored to be in the woods at the edge of our suburb. The modest wooden home had been abandoned for quite some time and was now fully derelict, and the quantity of suburban graffiti made it obvious that many kids had been there before us. We poked around a while on the first floor, finding nothing of interest. We decided to see if there was anything worth seeing upstairs. We had been upstairs less than a minute when we suddenly found ourselves getting buzzed by some type of very large, very territorial bee. One of them stung me on the shoulder. It hurt like a mother effer, and I still have a ball of scar tissue just under the skin 30 years later. Of course, I never told my parents. I felt my sting was punishment enough, and apparently it was, since I never again went into a vacant building, at least until I got older. I think it was a combination of the cops curious to see what you were up to, and then also to let you know that they definitely did see you. A friend of mine got an urbex tip about an abandoned military munitions storage, wide open gate, no locks, drove right in. Found these grass-covered bunkers, empty inside, but very cool and creepy. Took some great pictures. All of a sudden, a helicopter flies by low. Strange, but not that strange. My friend gets really spooked, though. Looked like a police chopper. He insists we pull the truck into the bunker to hide in case it comes back. I pull the truck in, and sure enough, it comes back. We all duck into the bunker, and this thing drops into a low hover right above us. Spotlight shining on the bunker door. We're completely effed. After a few minutes, we all agree, this is it. Squad car must be coming. Life is over. We just trespassed into some federal facility we only thought was abandoned. We're getting arrested. We all agree we might as well just come out. So we all walk out into the spotlight, show ourselves, set our camera and tripod down. Chopper hovers there. Nothing on loudspeaker. They're just looking at us. And then it turns and flies away. Uh, what does this mean? I don't know, just get in the effing truck. So we hauled ass out of there as fast as we can drive and never saw a sign of the police again. My husband grew up on the east side of Chicago on the Indiana border. There was an abandoned brewery there called Falstaff, I believe. The kids from the neighborhood would always go and explore all around it at night. Well, a small group went and one of the boys fell like three stories into an old granary and his friends got scared and ran away, leaving him there. Come morning, there was a big search for the missing boy, but his friends were too scared to admit what had happened. After a night or two, one of them was having nightmares and terrible anxiety and came clean to his parents. Parents called the cops and they found the boy who had died. But apparently he survived in the granary for some unknown length of time and may have survived if he was found quickly. Though this may just be an urban legend, it was incredibly horrific. My husband knew the kids and was there during the searches and aftermath. Real nightmare fuel. So you walk into an abandoned house and you find a room that's a satanic shrine. It's pretty bad. And then you see someone in that room? Yeah, that's, that's an Avengers level threat. 
I didn't do it personally, but I used to work for an insurance claim management company that contracted people who did, and I have two stories that stand out. One, one of our contracted employees entered an abandoned house and went room to room to confirm damages. Dude entered the final room to find out it's been fully decorated to be a satanic shrine. Our contractor saw someone just standing there in the middle of the room and bolted for the exit once he realized there was someone else in there. Two, lady I was walking through the process of accessing a property we were managing found a dead body. Appeared to have been recently killed too. Said that the guy was laying in a pool of blood. She quit because of this incident. I don't know if you can say it went seriously wrong, but here's my story. Me and two friends, one of whom was a photographer, went and explored an abandoned school in my hometown when we were teenagers. It was a rainy, dreary afternoon in March. We were all out for a walk after the rain had stopped, so our photographer friend could take some pictures, and our path led us past the school. I walked by it multiple times in the past, and I always wondered what was inside. As we approached, we noticed that the front door was propped open slightly, so naturally we went inside. No flashlights, and this was before cell phones became ubiquitous, so no light sources other than what filtered through the windows. The place was in the middle of being converted into some sort of museum dedicated to World War II, which was a weird thing for a school in the middle of rural Pennsylvania in a town of less than 2,000 people. It was creepy as hell in there. Everything was dusty, and the smell of decay was everywhere, and all over these decrepit tables were little presentations about different battles and concentration camps. It looked like nobody had been inside the school for at least a year. We got to the stairwell, and collectively agreed was no way in hell we were going to the basement, so up we climbed. The second floor was untouched. The stairs opened up to a large central hall with three or four big classrooms on the outside. We wandered around the classrooms for a bit, and everything was still in place, like school let out for summer 20 years ago, and nobody ever came back. Books moldering away on the shelves, faint traces of chalk lines on the blackboards, desks covered in cobwebs. The eerie feeling I had gotten upon entering the building was getting stronger the more time we spent there, but my friends insisted we check out the attic before we leave. Finally, I agreed and we climbed the final set of stairs. As soon as I got to the top of the steps, the hair in the back of my neck stood up. The attic was pretty much pitch black, save for one big circular window at the front of the building. There was no floor in many places, just exposed beams we tiptoed across as we made our way to the window, stepping over moldy insulation and the occasional rat or bird skeleton. We get to the window, and as we stood there looking out, my eerie feelings turned to dread. Even though it was March, and fairly cold outside to begin with, it felt like my blood had turned to ice. As my photographer friend is snapping pictures, I started hearing voices from downstairs in one of the classrooms. I whipped my head around to ask my friends if they had heard it too, and they were both looking at me with fear in their eyes. They heard it too. My more rational friend thought maybe the museum workers were back, since the door was propped open when we got there and all. So we all hurried back to the stairs as quietly as we could. As we crept down the stairs, the voices abruptly stopped. The three of us froze, thinking maybe we had been heard sneaking around, but after what felt like five minutes, the sound never returned. We got to the second floor landing and peeked in each of the classrooms. They were all empty. The knot in my stomach tightened and we all looked at each other nervously. Let's get the F out of here, my photographer friend said, and we all rushed down the final set of steps and out of the building, not caring if we made any noise at that point. A week or so later, my photographer friend showed me some of the photos she had taken in the school. There were a couple with weird ghost orbs in them, which to be fair, could have been dust motes catching the light just right, but the one that stuck out the most was a shot of that big circular window in the attic. The lower right portion of the photo was obscured by this weird mist that almost looked like cigarette smoke. Only none of us smoked at the time, and it wasn't cold enough to see your breath that day. So, me and my friends, let's call them M and S, decided to visit a haunted hospital since there were rumors around it was haunted. So we get there, enter through a hole we barely got through, and started wandering around as anyone would do. 
As we were walking through the hospital, we heard a noise, sounded like a rock fell. So we dumb AF, we decided to check it out. There were like three or four people in this little room, compartment, or whatever you want to call it. Since it was the first one, I shushed my friends and signaled them to go back. As my friend S is walking back, he moves something and he makes a noise and all four look at us. We scream, run, run, and they chase us. We were all pretty fast and S was the last one to go through the hole and something drags him by his legs. He started rocking his legs. M and I got him out of there. Well, they were druggies, but I knew we were kids. So that was our scariest experience. And soon everyone would know about it, small town. The info got to our parents, and they were not very happy, and we all got grounded for like two weeks. I mean, a building like that, 18 stories, sounds incredible. Uh, your story really makes it tempting, but your friend's actions were truly harrowing, and he's extremely lucky to get out of there alive. Good friends. This is a long read, but well worth it for anyone who loves a good story. I used to explore the Michigan Central Station in Detroit before Ford began renovations on it. 18-story building and a pitch black basement. There were a few ways to get in, but the best entrance at least likely to get you caught by police, they patrolled around this building regularly because people tried getting in so often, was a tunnel dug underneath the steel wall of the train garage next to the station. It wasn't a long tunnel, it just went deep enough into the ground to clear the wall and then right back up again into the garage. The garage itself was pitch black with numerous pits so mechanics could work under the trains. Imagine it similar to the underground areas at an oil chain shop. These pits though were full of trash, broken glass, scrap metal, and other items that could easily impale and kill you by falling in. It was absolutely essential. All who went brought a flashlight for navigation in these areas. However, it was equally essential you did not use your flashlight unless you absolutely had to, as any light shining out from within the building could easily be seen by individuals outside the building, most likely police. This particular trip would be my last for more than one reason, and the individuals I took with me had much less experience doing urban exploration, particularly at this building. James had been once before, but hadn't been through the entire building. Chris had never been, period. I explained the flashlight rule, I explained the dangers, and I especially explained the police presence around the building. We headed there in the evening, and by the time we got there, it was almost night. Getting in went well. We hung around the car until we saw one officer drive by the tunnel entrance. As soon as he turned the corner, we booked it, one by one, into the tunnel, and back up again into the garage. We navigated into the building and began to explore. The building was known for its amazing graffiti. In particular, the 13th floor's graffiti was all themed on hell, Satan, and other unsettling words and imagery. We made it all the way up to the roof without a hitch, looked out in awe at the 360 degree view of Detroit, and started to make our way back down. This is where shit started to go very bad. Chris, despite my warnings, kept turning his flashlight on to look at graffiti. I had to continuously tell him to turn it off, but it was like he turned into a child. He wouldn't listen. James kept going off on his own to look at shit, even though staying in a tight group is what kept you safe, or safer, I should say. On our way down, James sees one of the open elevator shafts around the 10th floor. He decides he wants to throw a glass bottle down and watch how far it goes. I plead to him, it's not worth getting that close to it, it's too dangerous. He says he'll be careful, and walks over to it. He throws the bottle in, leans into the shaft to watch the bottle fall with his flashlight, and to my absolute horror, slips on a broken piece of flooring, falling into the elevator shaft 10 stories up. I ran over to the shaft, thinking I was about to see my friend's lifeless body all the way down at the bottom, but, unbelievably, he grabbed the elevator cables as he fell, and was two floors below us, hanging on for dear life. He screamed for help, and I told him to hang on and do not let go. Me and Chris booked it to the staircase, and I nearly killed myself as I leapt down the staircase, trying to get to the floor I believed he was closest to. I ran to the elevator shaft and looked in. He was right above me between floors, still begging for help. 
I told him he was too far up. He had to come down a bit farther for me to grab him. He was in tears, crying, and told me he couldn't. He had sliced both of his hands down to the flesh grabbing those cables. I told him he had to. There was no other way. I gave him words of encouragement and told him to fight the pain. He had to slide down farther. He slowly worked his way down, screeching in pain, but got close enough that me and Chris were able to reach out and pull him in. His hands were a bloody mess, two thick gashes across both of them. I took off my undershirt and wrapped up both of his hands. As relieved as I was, he was alive. I wanted to beat his ass for his stupidity. After me reaming him out, nearly in tears myself, I told both of them it was time to go. As we made our way down the remaining floors and into the main lobby, I see Chris, who is slightly ahead of us, stop in his tracks, quickly back up and turn around. Even in the dark, I watched his face turn ghost white. I asked what was wrong, and all he said was, cops. Four Detroit police officers just entered the lobby from the main entrance. I looked at both of them and told them, follow me now, fast. I took them through a maze of hallways, my adrenaline fueling my navigation. But even I hadn't explored every hallway of this place. Sure enough, we hit a dead end with nowhere to go except a pitch black room next to us. We went into the room and stood against the walls. Not an effing sound, I whispered. We could hear the cops' radios going off and footsteps getting closer. A few minutes went by, then an officer proceeded down our dead end hallway. His flashlight beam bounced in and out of the room we all stood in. We held our breath as he was feet away from the room and then heard him say on his radio, this hallway is all clear. He turned around and proceeded back down the hall and around the corner. We stood there dead still for what seemed like an hour. I could hear my heartbeat inside my ear canals like a drum. We waited until it was dead silent, stealthed our way back to the train garage as slowly and quietly as we could and made our way out. The car ride home was dead quiet, and I never went back to the train station again. That was 14 years ago. I was on a trip with friends. At the end of the trip, most of my friends were clicking pictures, and I was not super into it, so I decided to take a walk on my own. I didn't know where I was going, but I saw interesting buildings and wanted to go there. I was trying to remember every twist and turn I took so I wouldn't get lost. I took a left into a more rustic looking street which I soon regretted. After some time I realized there were a few brothels in the street and I was really scared. I was in my teens and ran into a building which was kind of abandoned. There I saw two serious looking dudes discussing something and one of them had a gun. I'm from India and guns with civilians are not common. I felt my heart slip. I quickly made a run for it and ran into the back door of the hotel where a guard saw me panicking and let me in. My friends and me were being really dumb, as all teenagers have been at least one time in their youth. We entered a stereotypical abandoned house, you know the one, huge, death plants surrounding all of it, a disgusting atmosphere that filled the air, we didn't care. We entered it, no fear in our eyes, or so we thought. We were prepared to see ghosts, witches, demons, but nothing would prepare us for that moment that changed our lives. We opened every door at that place until we reached the third floor when we saw it. A really old guy just sobbing in a corner. I vividly remember his thin body and balding head, kind of like Gollum, but way more terrifying and sad. Really, really sad. My friend approached him and he instantly bit her. He screamed, Mom, Mom, he's here over and over again with such a high-pitched voice. It made my head hurt. We ran out, thinking we had lived a paranormal experience, but we didn't. We, not so long after that, were told that the man belonged to a mental asylum. Not the first time he went back to that house, of course. Some nurse dropped him over. The horrible part is that we were told he always came back as happy as ever. Basically, he willingly returned to that asylum, as long as they allowed him to go back to his house. He seemingly went back once every three or four months, but was frightened by us, because besides being intruders, we apparently brought back memories of his abusive uncle. They had to bring him back. He wouldn't leave with the nurse as he usually did. He was banging his head on everything he could as they took him. Sadly, 
We made him return at least 15 years on this therapy. Man, to this day, I feel so much guilt and shame. We brought back so many traumas of that poor man just because we wanted to have fun. I'll never forgive myself. When I was about 12 or 13, me and a good friend of mine used to visit a rural woodland area near our houses, but soon found that the forest was like a bowl shaped and the rim was around some construction sites. Anyway, we climb up the forest walls, which were super steep, and we made a lot of grunting noises as we were climbing up. We kept walking up and climb under and over a fence, and the whole construction site is completely silent. There's like nothing there except a skip and weeds growing in every which way. It's definitely been abandoned for a while. Anyway, we did this a few times in that space of several months. And one time, I decided to journey to this area all by myself and check it out. So, I get there, and as I'm on my way to the bowl part, I stop and get my bearings right when a pretty big stick hits me really hard in the back of my head. I turn around and there's no one there. I even shout, who's there? And then pretend to laugh, assuming it's someone from my school playing a prank on me, but there's no answer. Now. The stick that had hit me wasn't just dropping from a tree, it came sideways, like an arrow almost down the aisle of the path I was walking down. I remember looking around and upward, thinking that it's crazy how I'm here completely alone. Anyway, I left straight away, mentioned it to my brother, who mentioned it might have been some exceptionally deadly owl that nips people's necks, eyes or ears, and then never mentioned it again because the thought of being there not alone is freaky. That's my mediocre story. I got hit by a stick and retreated back home. If you're reading these stories and you hear one where somebody says, we heard someone say, hey, and it's a dark figure and you're stuck in a dead end, usually doesn't end well. So this is one of those exceptions, but I guess pretty cool because it all worked out in the end, but pretty out there, man. So in my town, there's an abandoned paper mill. As dumb teenagers do, my friends and I decided to explore it. We knew of some other kids and from our high school who go there regularly, so we thought nothing of it. So we had been there for maybe 20 minutes or so, and we just see a dark figure and hear a loud, hey. Knowing that we were busted, we started to run into a dead end. Turns out it was the owner of the mill. He was a really nice guy and he gave us a tour. His vision was to turn the place into a five-star restaurant, but until then, he would rent out the space for film crews. A few horror movies had been filmed there. He was there just checking up on the place and sectioning off pieces of the floor that were weakening. He honestly probably saved one of us a trip to the ER because the floors looked fine till you put any pressure on them. We felt bad, so we showed him where the hole in the fence was so he could see it later. I never partook in the destruction I'm about to describe, but I did always come along for the pleasant long walk and because I was a lonely teenage boy. Anyway, I grew up in central Mississippi and there isn't a whole lot to do there. I was an especially nerdy kid and my parents didn't invest into high speed non dial up internet until I was about 16. Instead of sitting in a dark room in front of a screen all day, decided to start taking regular walks around the area. I'd often walk across people's farmland and most people didn't mind. They'd ask what I was doing if I was caught and I'd explain that I was just walking and then they'd tell me to be safe and not to damage anything. Anyway, more kids moved into the neighborhood I was living in and as I started to have company on my walks, one day, a few of the guys I would go for walks with asked me if I wanted to see this abandoned farmhouse. We walk about a mile, at least a quarter mile into a cotton field, then backed up to some woods. At the edge of the woods, there was this abandoned farmhouse. I refused to go in because of the sheer amount of animal shit all over the place and smell. Outside the farmhouse were a bunch of junked out rusty old cars and oddly enough, a train car. This became our destruction palace. We'd regularly walk out there and just smash stuff while I watched because I'm wimpy like that. After about a month or so of doing so, 
these other guys went inside and started smashing up the interior. One day, they came out and mentioned that they managed to smash some beams clean in two. Didn't think much of it and was never going inside actually to look. Fast forward a week and a really bad storm hit and everything began to dry out and we could walk out to the old farmhouse. We did. We get there and the place has completely collapsed. I'm fairly certain my friends had destroyed some support beams and the house could no longer withstand the storm and fell apart. I don't know anything about architectural integrity, but I can't help but wonder if we were ever in danger of having the whole place collapse on us. TL, DR, some friends of mine destroyed what were probably support beams in an old abandoned farmhouse and the next time we went out there the whole building had collapsed. I was exploring an abandoned building with a few friends. Ground floor was kind of empty, so I went upstairs alone. I was smashing a few windows while my friend came to the second floor and was exploring near me. A third friend yelled that Josh had fallen out of nowhere. I ran to my buddy, and just the look on his face horrifies me to this day. I called Josh's name down the hole he had fallen through. The only thing I heard was the noise his jacket made from moving. I ran to Josh downstairs and asked if he was okay. He fell from about 10 meters. He was awake, but not with his mind. Turns out he broke his jaw, some ribs, some spine bones, and his leg. The emergency team told us he was very lucky to be alive. Couldn't walk for the next six months. TL, DR, friend fell from 10 meters. My SO and I love exploring abandoned places. It's one of our favorite things to do on a warm weekend. There's an abandoned military fort in the middle of the Patapsco River that, if you can get to it, is easy to explore. It's been on our radar for a while, and when we purchased kayaks this summer, Fort Carroll was pretty high up on the list of places we wanted to paddle to. The entrance to the island is just under a mile from the park where we put our kayaks in. We made it to the island okay scaled the wall using the ropes left behind from previous explorers and hauled the kayaks out of the water. The island was beautiful and haunting and luckily still solidly built for having been designed by pre-Civil War Robert E. Lee. The problem was with leaving. Unbeknownst to us at the time, when my boyfriend lowered his kayak back into the water, he caught a rock on the way down and cracked it. It was a slow leak, but it was a long paddle back he had slightly swamped his boat while climbing the rope back down into it. Since there was already some water in it, he didn't notice the leak right away. About halfway to shore, he realized he had a problem. He made a gallant effort, but alas, his ship was sunk at about a quarter of a mile from the shore, and he had to finish the trip without the benefit of a flotation device. Luckily, he's a good swimmer. Also, luckily... I had tossed a rope into our exploring bag, just in case the entrance ropes were too rotted to use. So I was able to tow his fully submerged and extremely heavy boat back to shore. None of the unfortunate swimmer, as my hands were a bit full trying to handle both a paddle and a sunken boat. Used to explore an abandoned mushroom factory in Ohio uh -oh, with friends in middle school. Sometimes we would climb on the roof. One time we used a crowbar that was left behind to break into a door and walk around the rooms inside, but it was very dark and we didn't have flashlights. I remember one room had lots of black plastic trays with the mushrooms were grown at. We also explored an old water treatment outbuilding as well, with the retention pool next to it that had a large metal mixer swirling around. Back when it was in operation, the factory used to put off an odor that would waft half a mile or more down the road where we lived. It was the joke of our small rural road. One day, while riding our bikes up the long driveway back to the building, a car, SUV, and a Harley motorcycle came driving in at a fast pace. Drivers did not look like your typical businessmen. They may have some legitimate businesses at the property, there were rumors of drug deals performed back there, and this small invasion spooked us. We tore off on our bikes and didn't come back often after that. Long shot here, but I'm hoping someone from Edmonton will remember this place. 
There was an abandoned crematorium on 184th Street, I think about 25 years ago. Supposedly, graffiti of pentacles and blood spatters were all over the walls, but we would go there at night and explore. It was creepy as hell. I don't think it was ever a crematorium, but urban legend said otherwise. One night, my buddy and I were exploring. It was winter. As we were nearing the building, we heard footsteps walking toward us, crunching the snow. We stopped. The sounds would stop. It wasn't an echo. We started walking. They would start walking towards us again. We both booked it back to our car. You'd always see a police car slowly patrolling the main street as it was a pretty popular place. So, do you think it was the old groundskeeper or a squatter? And this was on Long Island? I think I might know where you guys were. Me and five of my friends went to explore an old building next to the college in our town back when we were 12. The college didn't use it, and it was decently far back into the woods. There was basically what you would expect from this kind of building. Old student papers, documents, and books thrown all over. Since we didn't think we found much at all, we decided to leave. One of my friends pointed out that there was a back door. We go out there and see a path leading up to a groundskeeper's house, we think. As we go in, it's clear that this house is not new and has been abandoned for a while. We go through the front door and the stench is horrifying. The carpets are ripped up, things are strewn about and broken across the room. There are family photos on the wall seemingly intact. After we look at the living room, we walk through the dining room into the kitchen via a pocket door that still worked. The kitchen looked like shit, with moldy food all over, stains on the walls, and the fridge had fallen down right in the middle of it all. As we decided to loop around through the hallway to go upstairs, one of my friends noticed that there is a door to the basement. It seems a little flooded, but that's normal, since we live five minutes from the Long Island shore. As we're about to go in, we hear a deep, raspy voice that said, Get out! Before we could even scream, we ran out and down the path to our bikes and left. Still the most terrifying moment of my life to this day. There was an abandoned hospital we used to go to when we were kids. Most people just went to the paths that were easy access, but there was another part of the hospital that you could only access by climbing on the roof of the lower level and getting in through a window. The lower levels of this particular building had sheets of metal covering all the entrances. One night, we decided to go into the restricted area. The first thing we noticed was, as we went down the hallway, was that there were roaches, which was unusual because it was so cold outside. I didn't pay much mind to it until we stumbled upon the dead body in one of the rooms. I only saw the bloated foot and don't think any of us have ever run so fast in our lives. We ran to the nearest payphone. Yeah, this was a long time ago, and called the police to report it. My best guess is a hobo probably went there to seek shelter and overdosed. There's an abandoned hospital not far from where I live, used for multiple uses before it shut down. There were a few windows with the plywood split off, so me and my friends would check them out. Annoyingly, a lot of the interior doors were screwed shut, and we didn't want to make a racket kicking them or anything. The landowners lived on the site and would call the police if they knew you were there. I saw that there was an old hatch in the roof, so I pushed an old bed and climbed through it to get to the next building along. I'm crawling through this dusty ass space and then my hand hit something squishy. My friend passed me a torch and I realized it was a Bible. I looked around me and I shit you not, there were stacks of Bibles all the way through this attic, no idea why if I was over the chapel or what. Anyway, I kept on crawling and suddenly the gangplank just gave way and I went straight through the roof and landed on the floor below me. The torch was still up in the crawl space. By this point, I'd passed two more walls so my friends couldn't hear me and every window was boarded up so it was pitch black. Creepy enough as it was, I started trying to pry open the wood to get some light to see where I was. You know in the movies, a shaft of light will shine in a perfect beam to illuminate something? What do I see? A baby. A baby's effing face. I nearly started crying right there. It was an old China doll. I'd fallen through into the old maternity wards. 
Eventually, I had gotten enough of the wood loose that the room was light enough and it was full of old buggies and children stuff that had been touched for 40 plus years. After getting my ass out of there as quick as I could, I ended up in an outdoor courtyard that was blocked off on all four sides. Had to climb up and over the roof to get back to my friends. Then, what do I do when I arrive to? Yep, police. This happened to my dad's high school teacher. He and one of his other friends wanted one friend to explore this haunted house in their neighborhood as like a prank or something. They asked the friend to do it, but he didn't want to. So the two decided they'd make a scavenger hunt and lure him into exploring the house. No idea why that was their idea, but yeah. So he goes through and at the end of the scavenger hunt was to go through the haunted house. The two friends watch as he enters and the requirement was for him to go up to the second floor bedroom and wave to them or something like that. However, as my dad's high school teacher and his friend wait and watch, they hear a crash and he doesn't come out. They run and get the friend's mom and walk in. They found him lying on the ground dead from a broken neck. They think a junkie or homeless man was squatting there and got spooked and killed him. Whoa. Nothing seriously wrong, just creepy. Used to love exploring a vast acreage that was once a munitions manufacturing plant, at least 50 different structures on the land. Some parts were incredibly well preserved, almost no graffiti, signage still present, bathroom mirrors and unbroken toilets still there, sometimes even paper towels still in the rolls. There was a furnace or boiler room in the upstairs of one building that was really cool in part because of the glass doors to the furnace and glass pressure gauges still being there unbroken. One night, my friends and I brought a bunch of candles and our hammocks and planned to camp out for the night. We went to that furnace room and were surprised to see it was full of ransackery, tons of things smashed and ripped apart, and the glass pressure gauges I liked so much were shattered. Oh well. The room led out to a rooftop where we hung out watch the stars and such before lighting tons of tea lights and hanging our hammocks. I was really tired and fell asleep. I woke up in the early light to hear a couple friends throwing rocks and being really loud. With my eyes closed, still sleepy, I kept telling them to stop being so loud and destructive, but they wouldn't stop. After a while of drifting in and out of consciousness, I started hearing two other voices that were absolutely not my friends. I hushed everyone as the voices got closer and came up the stairs. Two weird, methy-looking dudes came in and were somewhat startled to see us. One was wearing one of those flame print bowling shirts like Ricky from Trailer Park Boys, which definitely struck me as odd. I don't remember all of the conversation. It was really brief, but I remember one of them asking, do you like our destruction work in here? I definitely didn't like it at all. I was pissed that they ruined stuff that I really liked, but I wasn't about to get in an argument when I'm laying down and they're standing up, and we're out in the middle of an abandoned piece of land far from other people. I just kind of said, oh, that was you, or something like that. They left after a minute or so, and once we thought they were far enough away, we did too. Nothing really happened, but it definitely creeped me out. This happened about 50 years ago, when a friend and I were in elementary school. We lived in a bayside town that had an abandoned resort that closed in the 1930s, almost next door to his house. The main building was pretty well gone, but there were some side cottages and some cabana-like structures. We'd go exploring during the day to see what was around. Nothing was walled off or boarded up. If you knew where to push through the grass and bushes, you got right in. Anyway. We were exploring one of the cabana areas, which had showers and these ancient style toilets. My buddy looks at the toilet and sticks his hand into the drain. Now, there was no water or anything, but still a dumb thing to do, especially as his hand gets stuck. He's now in a panic, especially since we've been told by his folks to stay out of there. I tried a couple of things, but we couldn't get him loose. I ran back to his house and got a hammer from his dad's toolbox in the garage. Luckily, his dad was at work and his mom was doing stuff in the house and didn't see me. I bring the hammer back and start wailing on the toilet to break it up. However, I was 10 years old and not a very strong kid. 
I also didn't get a very big hammer, which didn't help. It took about 5 to 10 minutes for me to break the toilet enough to free his hand. It was a little bruised, but luckily nothing too bad. We snuck the hammer back to the house and washed off his hand and arm at the outside spigot at his house because it stunk, mostly from the mold or mildew in there. We figured that was enough exploration for the day. There were always more days to do stupid stuff, and we excelled at that. There were a bunch of long abandoned houses where I grew up, and I used to hike them and poke around and take cool stuff I found. When I say long abandoned, I mean these homes had been abandoned since the 1940s or earlier, and were getting reclaimed by nature. No one was coming back to bother with them. I was out and about this one time behind my parents' place and went back farther than I'd been before. I found this really tall concrete wall and I stacked up blocks to at least have a peek over it. I saw a house not far from the wall and it was definitely abandoned from what I could see with my binoculars and the naked eye. So I climbed back down and I'm making plans to ask around about it. First one with a wall like that, it was weird and maybe come back out for treasure hunting when something sprints by me really fast and I froze. It was a bullet, and I took off after seeing two guys on quads staring me down. They shot a couple more times, but I don't think they were trying to hit me, just scare me off, because the bullets were close, but not close enough for me to be like, oh shit, I'm gonna get murdered out here. I was also zipping down low like a rabbit and trying to stay hidden, so maybe that helped, lol. Even though it tore my face right the f up. Yikes. So anyway, I go home, clean myself up, and didn't say a word about it because I didn't want to get in trouble for trespassing. We lived pretty rurally at the time, and that was a huge no-no, so I kept my mouth shut. A few months later, we learned there was an illegal grow operation that got busted back there, and I realized that the guys I saw on the quads were probably the guards or whatever for the perimeter. I still didn't say a word, and my parents didn't find out until my little brother mentioned it in passing about four years ago, when I was 30. They weren't exactly thrilled, but finally understood why I'd stopped going treasure hunting back there. <laughs> Getting shot at will definitely do that.